Hello everyone, let's begin with the new week and in this week we will be discussing about Excel, file opening and JSON and processing and this week is going to be workshop number three uh, so let's begin so Python provides us with a built-in mechanism functions and libraries which enables us to interact with files on the computer which is running Python it does Python is so flexible that it lets you deal with all the files all kind of files that you have on your system and play with them yeah so why do we want to programmatically store and read data there are two pointers for that for data science this is how we might read in some raw data and process it ready for other analysis. Yeah, we might want to fetch some data from a different file and use it for data science and turn that raw data into something meaningful data. And number two, if we have written procedures for calculation, putting these in manually via a process such as input or by hand by a program is inefficient. We want to do bulk processing. Yes, we do. If we have like mathematical expressions and inputs that we have to take a single time for a set of data set, and let's say the data is like a thousand times, so doing it manually is a waste of resources, time, speed, processing, and whatnot. So we do need to have something that can do the bulk processing for us once we write the algorithms for them. Now, Python provides built-ins for dealing with files, often called file descriptors. Python knows how to talk to the operating system. It uh, doesn't matter whether it's Windows, Mac, Linux, Python knows how to deal with them and handle the complex stuff. So let's forward with the opening files. Python provides a function called open brackets, which accepts various arguments. You can go through this link here for more detailed instructions on the doc on Python on opening files. And some examples for after this lecture are here, which are tutorials for you to go through if you're interested. Now, we are concerned with file and mode for now. You must provide it with a file. Other keywords such as mode are optional. Example as below, open my file dot text under the parentheses the bracket and single, single commas and mode is R. You do not need to use mode all the time, but in default, it really helps. And later on, defining the mode really helps. So R here stands for read mode. I will only be allowed to read the contents, not write anything to it. Fair enough. Now let's go to the local versus absolute file paths. The first argument is always a file path. These can come in two flavors, local files that are on your system and absolute files that are in a different directory. Local, these are relative to the Python's current directory. Typically the same directory your IPYNB is in. If you're in my documents, it would look for files there. Example, my file.txt. And for this tutorial, oh, in this tutorial, I'll be using the local directories the local rather than the absolute one where I have to define the directory where my file exists let me show you an example there you go I will be using this current directory and my file.io IPYNB is in the same directory as my other three files that I will be using throughout the tutorial so let's begin yep and absolute, these are the full file paths. Let's say your IPYNB file is in a different directory and your file that you need to use, let's say my underscore file the text in a different directory, then you need to provide the directory, full directory pathway to Python to process it. Now let's talk about open modes. With files, we may want to open them with different permissions. This depends on what our purpose for opening the file is. Are we wanting to just read the contents? Or do we need to modify the data of the file itself? Secondly, we are dealing with plain text, English readable text. Yeah. Or are we dealing with raw data, bytes? Those are ones and zeros and binary data. So R means open file for reading default. R permissions means open file for reading, which is the default one. W, open file for writing. L take a pause and listen to this clearly. This will literally destroy anything and everything which is already existing in the file and overwrite it. A means append. Open the file for writing, but will add to the end rather than destroying it. 
if it has already some data into it and you use the mode a which is a pen it will add the data at the end rather than destroying it or or overriding the whole file b is for binary mode and t is for default text mode we can mix and match the symbols above for mode strings example mode r or r and b read text versus read bytes mode w is for write in but and mode a for append in so write files overrides versus append in so here's a little bit syntax for you based on our files which is right here my underscore file let's have a look at it hello students so f equals to open parenthesis my file text see the comma and here's the mode which is append which means open and what i will be putting in will be appended in the file by default if i don't specify b all of these modes will be dealing with normal text this is what i'll be using throughout but bytes do have their places here's an example for you for opening binary file in text editor it looks like something like this all right once we have successfully open our file the variable becomes a type of file object text io wrapper you can check that by typing the type command f open the same parentheses of my file and you can print type and it gives you as a text input and output wrapper these objects have some methods we can use read line read line allows us to read in a single line from our file if we do this iteratively it gets the next line check check the syntax it's print f dot read line two brackets open and close brackets yeah and write this accepts a string in case of text which can write this will be our line remember are we in the write mode or the append mode if append mode then it will go at the end of the file but if it's in the write mode the, whatever the data it has gets destroyed or it gets by and you overwrite it so let's have a look the same command but we have changed the mode as a which is append and if i write f dot write after the war i went back to new york it will append the junk data so let's have a look so read lines same as read line however it will return a list of all lines in the file write lines same as write but it will but however it writes a list of lines to the file remember the mode so let's have a look so our file is long underscore text and if you can see this dear theodosia what to say to you you have my eyes you have your mother's eyes so if i print this if i use f open long text dot text and i print read lines and i make it print it gives you the first line dear theodosia what do you say and if i do lines it will give you all of it remember so let's move forward in the next one f equals to open long text which is the same file and what i'm doing is i'm using the print f dot red line and i'm using three of them and proving my concept that once you do this you can print each line and the next line accordingly let's say now we have the fourth line and so on and so on you can so let's have a look here f open junk.txt now what we are opening is junk.txt and what do we have in the junk text it's a random variable so what i'm doing is i'm writing it f dot write do make sure that the file is open and the mode is right here which means it will be overwriting and once i write it after the war i went back to new york it will split out how many characters it's in so let's have a look and let's prove right now the file has this which is my junk.txt and once i 
execute this let's have a look did you see the file is overwritten so this is this is the power of python and do remember once you have opened the file in the right for right mode you use f dot write and within the brackets you write what you want to change it with whether it's a string or anything else and then you can open it f dot open gender text but in read format and you can print read line to check the line of the file i hope this makes sense let's go forward so in this one f dot open the same file junk i'm opening it as, as append and let's see what happens if i append these lines back into my file so f dot write lines because it's 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 a multiple lines it's not a single line and my line which is a list of strings so and then we open the file open junk dot text which is in the mode of r not in w if you use w it get over it and if you use a it gets appended and for entry in f dot red lines print entry so what it will do it will print each line and let's have a look at it. Yeah. So this was from the previous. This was from the previous. After the war, I went back to New York. And this is what that got appended line by line in the jump.txt. So what if you want to print it? line by line with the index and making sense. So here's a little bit code for you to try. It is exactly the same, but here I'm using for I entry in enumerates lines and the line is F dot red lines, uh, which is my F of the junk data, which is like F equals to the junk data, junk dot text in mode read and the lines equals to F dot read lines. So lines has all the lines of F, which is the junk data in read format so when i do the enumeration for i dot comma entry in enumerate lines and i print print i and entry what it does is it prints all the lines and tells you the index of it so this is the line one this is the two and this is the three and there you go let's have a look if it does right yep there you go so let's go forward and let's check this out. So uh, the same code, but for lyrics in my lines, in my lines, print lyrics and f write lyrics. So whatever the print is, it gets rewritten back. And let's open it up and check. So now it got rewritten, and there you go. And there's only one line which is the length of the lines, it's telling you it's just only one line. Let's move forward to CSV. I hope at this point you know how to play with the junk, with, with the text files and the notepad files you have. And now let's forward to CSVs. We often represent files with certain types. Think about the files you commonly use, doc files, PDF files, XLSX files, there are many types. There are specific ways the file is formatted so that it is understandable. So why do we need these files? The basic answer is transfer, common representations. Both sides can understand this format. If I give you a PDF, your browser knows how to interpret the data to display something. Likewise, you can export a PDF and I can read it. Some Same goes for any data format we use, even IPYNB, which is a data format. So let's go for CSV, which means comma separated values. It is arguably the simplest form of data format we use today. Microsoft Teams spits out attendance in this format. It does. It is simplistic with each row representing some data entity record. This could be a person or a single data. It can be anything. And typically we use the columns for such a data format to store attributes. It could be a person's age, email, date, or date of birth, etc. Each value is separated by a comma. If the data entry is empty, we still need to put the comma. This data format is flat. It has no inherent structure other than a table, just values separated by commas as said by the extension CSV. We often use the first row of a CSV file to denote the names of the header. 
otherwise it can be difficult to know what each field is meant to be if we want to represent rich data here with the structure think list with dictionaries dictionary with dictionaries dictionary with list we have to flatten everything first we can do some important context to data this way it can be a tricky tricky manage yeah reading something that is dictionary within the dictionary in a csv or a dictionary with a list or dictionaries list and a combo of them it can be tricky and it can be really tricky to read them, to manipulate them, to use them. And you will find that in your last assessment in the customer data pre-processing something similar to that. But don't worry, a solved example, it's a solved example, the solution is also provided there, so you're fine. So CSV, not so nice. See, the first column is always, always the headers, and then if you can see it's not always uh, fine and if you can see these two commas it's a blank entity it's a blank data but still exists we have to give it to it all right the next one is json json stands for javascript or object notation it is primarily used for web data communication between your browser and the web server as the data can only be text for the most part, the concept behind this was to have a rich data format which facilitated easy communication between browsers and the servers by having a format which clo closely resembles the one used by a language itself. As this format was widely adopted by the web, it is, other fields began to adopt it for their purposes. You will com commonly find JSON used as file formats in non-web related domains. JSON is far more complex as a notation with use of curly brackets, colons, commas, and yep, etc. In fact, JSON objects share a string striking similarity with the dictionaries we have yeah, like we have been using in the Python video. As it allows such a rich description of the data, it enables us to not only store values, but also the structure of the data. Uh, this is something you cannot find in plain dictionaries. So this is what makes a JSON different. It enables us to have nested structures, dic dictionaries in a dix, exact, etc. So here's an example of JSON. If you can see, there's a dictionary which is starting here. And within a dictionary, there's another dictionary which ends here. The contact has particular more dictionaries in it. And then there's a list, and this is the end of the dictionary. So there's an opening of a dictionary, then there's a list within a dictionary. See, nested JSON object. So other types, XML, YML, many more. CSV and JSON are not the only data formats available to us. Many more exist. A common example is XML. Readability is an important aspect of data formats, especially where humans are meant to interact with them. Lots of Microsoft data output is XML and is overly verbose. Anybody can make a data format and decide what things mean. It's a widespread adoption and usefulness which indicates how good of a data format it is. XML example, overly verbose, lots of text, looks very html -ish. See, this is an XML. So, let's go to exceptions. You may have already encountered errors before now when doing workshops. Think back to workshop one, grace plus five. So far, these have just been red scary messages which we can't do anything about. Python executes the problematic code and something bad happens, blows up at runtime. See, a type error. Python, but Python is a little bit smart about it. It provides you a way to catch errors that are thrown and it allows us to attempt code that we know may be risky and do something if that error is encountered. What we need to do is we need to introduce two new keywords which are try and accept. It follows the general formula. Try, you write that risky code within it. Remember colons, accept, some exception type as friendly name, do something with the friendly name. It's easy as that. So let's go and try this code and see what happens. Will it run it or will we get a red error message which scares us? So here we are trying this risky code within the try and accept exception as er, then print er and print the type er. Let's run it. 
you see this ran and the error was caught and the error was can only concatenate string not integers to string and the class type is type error so you may notice two things here exception which is a type all errors in python are actually types this allows us to check for them and even drive from them Exception is the most generic type of error we can have. In fact, all other errors in Python stem from this. Exception will catch literally any and all errors. Notice how that the type of our error here was type error, yet it entered the exception type block. This is equivalent of saying dog is a type of animal. Therefore, it, if we are catching all animals, of course, dog matches the list, right? So, in general, it's a good idea to use specific errors. This is beneficial as it allows you to execute specific codes in response. We can stack as many accept clauses here as we need. For example, let's have a look. Try x equals to a string grace plus 5. Accept type error as e, print specific. Accept exception as er, print catch all. So now let's try and run this. And it gave you specific because you do remember the type of the previous was a type error, which is itself a type. And we made it as a type as E, and then we made a print if this encounters specific. And here you are. So Python will match the most specific type of error, it will only match a single except clause here. Notice how it never prints catch all, although this. Criteria was being met, but it only printed this one because this was more specific and more concentrated. Yeah. And this one, because exception catch, catches all the errors, was more generic. All type of errors are caught by exception. So note. So what if we modify our try block? Let's make some arithmetic errors. For example, try x equals to 5 divided by 0 if you do remember any number divided by 0 is infinity or undefined so let's do this exception type error as e print specific exception the same the same one catch all so in this in this one in this example it gave you a catch all error do you know why because this was not a type error uh, but exception has exception kind of catches all kind of errors and it was a zero division error so it kind of caught the, in the exception zero division error let's try this again but in a different way so what i do is it is exactly the same one i divided by zero and i do accept but this time i'm using the previous one zero division error and I'm naming it as A and print zero error and I make an egg. another exception which is the same one there you go and let's see which one gets printed Oops, yeah, there you go. So basically, 5 divided by 0 was a 0 division error, and it didn't go for the exception this time. It went for the 0 division error because it's a type, and it gave you a 0 error. There you go. Simple as that. I've done a bad thing with numbers. Dividing by zero is a zero division error, which is a form of arithmetic rule. If anyone here right now in my video is a, is a math, is from maths, is from engineering perspective or a business one, you do realize I've did a grave mistake, which is an arithmetic error and I should be punished. <laughs> no, I shouldn't. Because this is just for Python. Python is not maths. Python works with maths, but it's not totally maths. Because I haven't written an accept clause for it, it's gone to the only one which fits, which is exception, which I've just explained earlier. But if I didn't have exception there, what would have happened? 
well then it would have behaved as your python script have thus far python will error out red text everywhere let's have a look see if i didn't put an exception if i didn't use an exception cause x equals to 5 divided by 0 which is undefined doesn't match with a type error so it won't print specific but i didn't provide it with an exception so it's give you a zero division error and tells you it's a division by zero wake up and you can see a whole bunch of built-in exceptions at the following documentation pages so feel free and go there so let's go exceptions in file handling and look at your function within the documentation. Develop should tell you what the various exceptions and functions can throw. Have a look at it. How am I to know? Lots of trials and errors. If a new exception pops up that is expected, not just a mistake on your part, then you can write the exception clause for it. And opening a file, if it doesn't exist, will get a file not found error. Let's say I have a file. I have opened file not existing.txt. Do some file stuff. I want to read it. Print the first line. Print all done uh, with the file stuff. Now I should close it. App dot close. So once I run it, see there is no file, and you're getting a new error, which is file not found error. So what we can do here is we defined f equals to none and made a try. F open this and accept file not found error as err and print. Oops, we need an actual file. Print, we can actually continue doing this through. And let's see what happens. So once I do this one, cause there is no file, it gives it this try and accept catches the file not found error as error and gives you a print since this is this is fulfilling, this is being true. It gives you a print. Whoop, need an actual file here. And we also get a print of this. There you go. So what if something bad happens while, while we're dealing with a file? Python error file will never close. Yeah. As we need to always ensure the file is closed once we're done with it, this poses a problem. Solution, we could have many except clauses, hope they are all there, or use a generic catch-all exception one, but we still need to do file close in each one. Introducing finally, finally is a part of the whole try and accept structure. It allows us to try some code, catch any potential exception, and then finally execute some other expressions. This will be executed no matter what, whether the try block raises or not any errors. This is perfect for our use case. Caution, keep this block as simple and clean as possible. If an error happens here, you're still in trouble. For this example, let's assume our file exists. We want to do some things to it, so we have some Python code to execute. If we get an error here, we'll never get to our file close. Let's use grace plus a string plus an integer as our poison chalice. So I'm saying open my files.txt as f, do some file stuff, whatever it is, then print f dot read. And x equals to grace plus that our wrong bit of code. This could easily be an any error. Print all done with file stuff now. I should close it and f dot close. So exactly the same code above and once i run it it does give me a hello students because i'm reading it and it closes it but it tells us the same type error so let's fix this up with our try and accept keywords let's do this so this is try print f read x grace plus five print all done with an f close but except the last one was yeah except type error as e drat something went wrong so whenever the type error occurs you get the print but the code still runs it doesn't run this because this x generates an error which is caught by the except and hence we get the print but it moves forward and prints the rest and closes the file and there you go So mixing in our finally, let's go for the finally one. Yeah. So it's, the code remains same. F equals to open my file underscore text. Try print f dot read x uh, a string plus five. Our wrong bit of code. This could easily be any error. Then we do an accept type error as e. Since I know the type, so I'm using as a type error and defining it as e. 
and that print dropped. Something went wrong. And finally, no matter what happens, this code will get executed. And this is the finally part. Hello, students. Right. Something went wrong. And only concrete strings. All done with the file stuff now. I should close it. There you go. In the last, we're going to talk about the context managers, which is the best practice used while you're in, in the field of coding. So far, we have to remember to close the file ourselves and be very con conscious over potential errors coming from somewhere and ruining our day. Introducing context manager. These wrap our code and provide a convenient access to files within a specific context. They automatically handle closing the files for us. We need to we need a new keyword here called with. So instead of just opening the file, you can use with command with it and it automatically closes the file for you. What are the benefits? Reduces the amount of boilerplate code that we need, handles the file closing for us, decluttered, more Pythonic. If you're continually open files, let's say you open a billion files and you now you need to close a billion files or they get wrapped up. So if you're using with, you do not have to worry about it. With eventually does it for you so if you continually open files without closing them eventually you'll hit a limit only a limited number of files can be opened by our os at any times yes process and memory we have some limits primarily if an exception is encountered python automatically closes the file properly so try and finally close becomes with open so overall all the structure above becomes with open and do your stuff so let's have a look with that. So notab notably, this uses the as keyword, which we introduced in workshop to, to provide a handle to the file itself. When we move outside of the block, the file will be closed. This is the simple file where we open it up and look at here. I'm using the with along with as, and I'm defining my my file is as my underscore file, and I'm making a print about it. But it's exactly the same. But in this one, I do not have to care about closing the file because with already does that for me so i hope you had fun learning about the python and the files and the csv and the json we will go further on the json and the excel in the next videos so let's see you there bye hi let's begin with the csv reader in this video lecture and in the previous one we have talked about how to handle files and about um, different types of reading and what we can do to use with commands and how we can use the try and exceptions and stuff and in this one we will be focusing on our csv reader so in order to work with csv data formats we can use the library csv from python just like how in the workshop you did import random to pull in the random library functions remember you only need to import libraries once. This is typically done at, at the top of the Python file. You can see that. And in case you do not have the CSV reader libraries installed, and but you have the Python installed, so what I want you to do is I want you to open the CMD command and clear and just pip install C CSV. And when you press enter, all the files of CSV, all the libraries of the, of the CSV will get installed in your computer. And that will enable your Python to read and manipulate data for, for regards to CSV. All right. So as I said before, you only need to import the libraries once. So this is here, import CSV. And once you have imported it and you have read it, shift and enter, it doesn't need to be rerun again and again. It's in the memory now. And Python knows that what we are going to be dealing with CSV, so he knows where to pick the libraries from. So let's move forward and read about opening a file. Before we can read or write the data format CSV, we need to actually open the file itself. I have created a sample data file in your, it's available for you to download from your Udemy account. But for us to read in here, I will be using sample underscore data dot CSV. Let's have a look. This is the one, if I'm right, let's open it up. Yep. This is the one we'll be using. Yeah. So 
Remember, we can use context managers. Context managers are with and as to handle the closing of the file automatically. So we will be using something like this with open sample underscore data CSV as CSV file and pass since right now we do not want to do anything. So let's go forward. CSV reader. CSV contains two primary concepts, and this is something for you to always remember when you're dealing with the CSV. CSV reader. This is responsible for parsing the data of our file and comprehending. It will know to break down the file based on the commas, since it's a comma separated values, and provide us with a way of interrogating the data. And the second one, something similar from the previous one, is CSV writer. This can take up a Python data structure and correctly write it to a file. Yes, we could handle this ourselves, but this does the heavy lifting, less prone to error from our part, and more, and more bulk processing. So, this is the syntax with open the file name, which is CSV, a CSV file, and then we do CSV underscore reader, CSV reader, and we define the delimiter of the file. The first thing that has to come the file, which we have defined as CSV underscore file. It can be a, it can be any file. You can write this as uh, any file, but make sure when you're reading it, you name it exactly the same yeah but for now we'll be using csv underscore file and the delimiter we define it to the python the delimiter that separates the value from another value is this it can be a different it can be different but for this it's a comma so it's a comma separate value so we define it through this and then we are ready to read and this is a csv reader now we can read our file by using this variable yeah from the above, we can make a CSV reader, passing it the file we want it to read and the delimiter, the character here, this is the delimiter. The character uses to break everything up by. In our case, we want to split based on commas. Let's take a look at the CSV reader can give us. Let's have a look at the file first, which I've already shown you before. So we can see actually what we're getting the print out of it and compare with the actual file. So there you go. We will have name, age, and email, and phone number of four entries of Jenny, Dylan, Marcus, and Jackson, their ages, their emails, and the phone numbers. So don't worry about this. This is just a random generated email, random generated numbers. It has nothing to do with a real life person. So what I did was I said with open my file, a CSV file, the CSV reader, uh, CSV underscore reader equals to CSV dot reader and as a CSV file the main file and the delimiter is comma and for line in CSV file print line so what the for loop will do is it will print every line of the CSV reader which is actually the CSV file which is renamed from the sample dot data CSV and it will print the line so once we run it there you go but if you can see And here you go. Yep. There you go. It's exactly the same. The same emails and the same numbers. There you go. Have a look at it. So let's move forward. For each line in our CSV data file we provide, it has split the elements based on the comma. Each line is actually a list. Yes, it is. If you can see, it is starting with a capital bracket and ending with a capital bracket. So it is a list, which are an every entry is a variable based on the first column, which is the headers. For every element of the list, we get different data attribute. The issue, we still don't know what each one is yet. Let's improve our logic. Using enumerate, we can add some way to keep track of which line we're uh, currently on. Remember, CSV files typically have the first row as the header information. We don't want to bundle that in with our actual important user data. So let's do this one. So. We open the file with 
open sample data or csv a csv file the csv reader as csv reader and define the delimiter of the file csv file and then we made a for loop where the line number and the line in enumerate of the csv reader because now if we want to read the file we will be using the final variable csv reader for anything and everything related to the sample underscore data or csv so for line number line in enumerate csv reader print line number which will give us this row and line which will give us the columns you can so once i run this it tells me at which number i am at and so at line number one there's jenny line number two there's dylan line number three there's marcus and line number four there's jackson so it actually tells me how many counts do i have so as we know the order of the attribute names thanks to our first row we grab things like age we know it's going to be at index one of our row list let's grab all the ages and put them in a list so we can calculate something about them their mean so with open sample file the csv file csv reader and CSV, this is the basic ones from the previous one we defined a list ages capital brackets and empty list and for line number line and numerator csv reader for line number equals to zero continue because i don't want the headers to be included so i say if if there are line number if the line number is zero if the index is zero i do not want anything to do with continue but after you continue print the line number and the line print type line one ages dot append to line one and append it into the ages here so print ages age and mean age is equals to sum age divided by the length of the ages and print mean age equals to mean so if we can see now we have a, having a print of the index and the line and telling us what kind of what kind of data type it is and in the end we are also having so the mean ages and the every summation ages so now let's focus on the writing just how we obtain each row of a csv file one at a time we can also write to the file one at once this is still dictated by the open file mode remember w which is the write mode will entirely override the file a will append to it let's get some new data to represent a person in this data so we can add it to the csv file so we have this new entry dave 35 dave back dave at the sg.example.com and having a number so similarly we have to open a file and create a csv object this time instead of read reader we will be using writer so with open sample data to csv mode append a csv file customer writer csv is no longer reader it's a writer we define the file and the delimiter and then we say customer writer since the mode is append it will get appended write row dave and all of the data included in it and this should have this should have added it back to our csv once we are out of that context manager block the file is closed let's open it up in the read mode to see if our new davy entry is there so with open sample file in read mode as csv file csv reader csv reader we define the file and the delimiter and for row and csv reader print row let's have a look Ta -da! you can see davy here now there you go so let's go on writing with dictionaries how can write rows pretty easily we can write rows pretty easily each element is just the next attribute along the csv writer will put the commas in for us making sure our data format is consistent however we can also write in some dictionaries too so with open we define as a reader delimited this for num row in csv reader if num equals to zero headers equals to row and print headers see now we have the headers and the next one let's make some data to put into which confirms to this dictionary 
So I have a dictionary, my dictionary, cook, age, email, phone number, and I say with open another data dot CSV with more write as new file. Write a CSV dictionary, new file, field names equals to headers, write row dictionary. And it gets written. And now when I run this to check it out, there you go. There's Kirk 49, Captain James track example. Something of my dictionary is now here in the list as we expected. So, I hope you understood about the CSV Read and Write in Python. Let's move to JSON next and see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hello, welcome to the JSON Read and Write lecture. And previously, you have, we have discussed about CSV and the regular file input and output. But now, this time, we're going to focus on JSON. So we've already covered the concepts of using a high-level library to perform the heavy lifting of going between a raw file and a data format in the previous lectures. Just like with CSV, we need a context manager to manage our file itself. Then we can use JSON writers to take our Python data structure and convert it appropriately and write it. Firstly, just like CSV or random, we need to import the library JSON. So just import it, import JSON. So, Let's make some arbitrarily complex data regarding Rob's duck. This contains first name, last name, location, whether he's a sane, uh, the duck, Twitter followers, and list of weapons. Remember, we can nest data structure inside the others. So I have some dictionary, some dictionary, where the first name is Davy, last name is McDuck, location is Rob's office, and uh, is, it, is he insane, which can be a true or a false boolean. And followers and integer weapons wit, steely stare, devilish good looks, and remorse. Does he have any remorse? None. So to prove it, it's a Python dictionary. JSON Python dictionary looks very close. I'm gonna do the type command and check the type of my sum dictionary. And let's have a look. See, we made a print of the sum dictionary, which told us the dictionary of this. And it told us that the class is dictionary. So what we can use even in the JSON is the with commands. And we can use the modes W. Uh, whatever we feel like we can use append. We can use read and we can use write. Same accordingly to the previous example. So let's talk about writing. We can write to a file by using the JSON dump function. It accepts a dictionary to convert and secondary the file to write. Yes. So with open duck manifest.json, if you can see your Udemy portal, there will be a duck manifest JSON, something like this, with having these values already in it. And I'm opening the duck underscore manifest.json in the mode write as manifest. And then what I'm going to do is we're going to use the command dump, json.dump, and Whatever I want to dump, for example, some dictionary, there you go, and I want to dump it into the manifest, which is my uh, empty dictionary, duck manifest or JSON. Let me show it to you. I'm going to delete everything of this and save it. So now we have nothing in the dictionary. It's a 0kb. And what I'm going to do is now I'm going to run it. So once we run it, in the write mode, it gets overwritten, and some dictionary, whatever the dictionary I have mentioned in previously here, which is the Davy McDuck dictionary, it gets written in my manifest, which is my duck manifest or JSON. So let's run it and let's check it out. If you can see, it was 0 KB previously, and now it's 1 KB, and the dictionary has been written inside the duck manifest, or more probably overwritten. So remember this, you need to be careful here because the order is backwards here. So whatever you want to write in whatever you want to write, this is the rule of the thumb. This is a little bit different here in the JSON. So remember, what about reading? What about we want to read the JSON file? So likewise, reading, you, uh, likewise reading, reading uses the function json.load. It's not a read uh, reader, it's a json.load. This accepts a file to open and interpret. So with open duck manifest JSON as R as manifest print type, you can print it. Let's print it. So it tells us that the class is a dictionary or 
you can print the whole file whatever it contains here so you use print json.load manifest and it gives you whatever is written inside of it there you go so let's focus on the variance we do not need context manager here we do not as we're not dealing with files so read in we can tell json to work directly with the strings instead of reading from a file we can read directly from a string perhaps this string was given to us by some web-based means so json load stands for load strings it can difficult it can be sometimes be difficult to spot json load versus json loads a json string may look like a dictionary notice how null is there and true is lower cased but in python true has to be in the capital t and the null well we do not deal with nulls that much where is the capital n so we can see mapping between python and json they are similar but subtle differences exist i want you to re always remember although python and json are similar but they have their differences that's why they're different so let's have a look so i have some json those string here's a string and within a string there is a dictionary overall this is a string and i said print this and when i said print type some json string and print some json some underscore json dot string let's have a look so funny thing when i print the type of this variable it gives me a string which is all right yeah it is a string if you can see there are parentheses here but when i say just print this file print this variable which contains this file it gives me a dictionary funny isn't it so be careful things are different between json and python it's not actually the same they can be a dictionary they can be a string and overall the output can be really confusing but you need to know what kind of type of data you're dealing with so let's have a look here so convert it from json this is something i'm converting from json so json dot loads and some json string i'm loading it print converted from json print type converting from json and as you can see once i use the json dot loads on my some json string it gets converted into a dictionary it gets converted into a json and once i do the type command to check the type of it it tells me it's a dictionary and the print is exactly the same previously but now the null is none and the true automatically converts into capital true so writing json dumps stand for dumb string which will convert the python object to json and return a string rather than going and modifying a file so if i have a dictionary my dictionary let's say with the random values and i want to print json uh, dot dumps and my dictionary so as you can see there you go it converts back whatever i have here in my dictionary format into the json format now none converts back into null and the true is a small t true there you go all right let's see you in the workshop number three unsolved in the next video and if you have any questions so far by now please send me a message on my or from your udemy account and i'll be really happy to help you out hello students welcome to the workshop three task um and in this one we'll be we're going to be talking about the uh, file io csv and json file formats that we have discussed earlier in the previous lectures so let me give you a little bit of introduction before we move on forward to the exercises and later on to the lectures where we are solving those exercises together so what are the aims of the workshop <clears throat> last week we looked at the functions and classes and how we might build up on our repertoire of code into reusable sections using these concepts as well as break down problems into smaller easier to manage sub problems an example of this was an exercise from last week where we converted grays into classifications where we inserted the filters if you remember and we checked if a certain student had a grade uh, fulfilling a certain criteria what kind of grades do they deserve but we let it depended on python to decide that based on the criteria that we told it to all right whereby we can build a simple function 
which takes one number and produces one string. Using our knowledge of list comprehensions, we can simply apply the basic function to each element of grades. This week, we have looked at file input and output. Looking at how Python can interact with any operating system which is running it, either with Windows, Mac, or Linux, and manipulate files with reading and writing, or both. We explored how we might save data to files such that it can be easily understood by other parties and why data formats are beneficial in this regard. Notable examples of this were the comma separated values, which are CSV, and JavaScript object notation, JSON data formats. Along the way, we also introduce new vocabulary and keywords such as context manager using the with keyword along with as, as well as continue used in for loops. In this workshop, we will also briefly consider NumPy, which is a library for numerical computing within Python. And yes, we need to install it through pip install NumPy, which is quite easy. These are used to provide some nice functionality for calculation purposes. Most of the numerical computing within Python either uses this directly or builds on top of it. Please see the useful information below on how to look up certain Python functionality is provided. The concept behind this workshop is about discovery and experimentation surrounding topics covered so far. Feel free to discuss the work with me. Use your Udemy accounts and text me. Give me a message. Let me know where you're stuck and I'll always be there to help you out. So let's begin with the file IO. For this workshop, as always, save a copy of the completed notebook. Name this something memorable workshop three. So reading files and exercise one. Create a text file in the same directory as your Python notebook for this workshop session. Fill this text file with content of your choice. These could be your favorite songs lyrics. There, Theodosia from Hamilton will be my choice here. Name this as example ex1 underscore data text and you can find the file within your Udemy module in the resource manager in the resources and you can download it if you want or you can make your own text data with your own content I have no problem with that it will look something like this so I have uploaded my e, my example one underscore data to text with my data to use the to Udemy. Kindly download the file if you wish to follow along with my examples. And the example is here. Yeah. At the moment, we are not interested in the format of what is in the file, just the raw text within it. So all I want you to do is make a file. Either make a file or download the file that you have in exercise one, and let's begin. And make sure you put these files that I'm mentioning in the same directory as the Python notebook workshop 3 for them to execute properly because there will be a local source not the external February one. All right. <clears throat> let's move to exercise number two. In our workshop 3 notebook, let's open this file and get Python reading this data in. From the lectures, we know that we can use open brackets to open any file path we provide. Remember open bracket returns a file object itself Assigned to a sensibly named variable. For now, we will specify the file path as the local file path, and we will explicitly pass the argument mode r, which is a readable one, even though this is the default value. Once we have this assigned to a variable, we can print the type of the variable as an object to see what it is. This should look something similar to this. Yeah. To check the type of it, all you gotta do is run the code. So in this lecture video, we'll be discussing about the exercises without solving them in the next one, in the next uh, workshop three task solve, we will be discussing about the solution, the solved exercises, the same one we're discussing right now. All right, let's go to exercise number three. Let's read some data out from this file object. We can use a for loop, which iterates directly over lines in the file itself for each line in the file prints the line, yes. You can use a for loop within the code in the with command and you can have a print of all the lines one by one with the from your textbook if things don't seem to print read the beginning of exercise 4 and it makes sense so exercise 4 <clears throat> execute the for loop again we have a problem with the previous exercise if we try and execute the for loop again just printing the line we won't get anything out this is because we have already hit the end of the line 
Python is doing some tracking in the background, which keeps track of where in the files we are. As we already hit the end of the file by iterating over it with exercise 3, when we try to iterate again, no new lines have been added. Plus printing nothing. This isn't ideal. So every time we want to iterate through the file here, we need to reopen the file. Because once the file is closed, it's closed. You cannot use the for command for the line again. If Combine the notebook cell which opens the file with the iterating code from exercise 3 from the lectures this week. We also know that it's important to close a file once we've finished with it. So let's also add to the end the close command. Okay. You can use the merge command and merge both of them. But I'm not using that. There'll be a different way I'll be doing it. So my file, you open, you print, and for line, and print, and then close. Let's have a look at it if that works. But this time, there's no with or as. We're opening it as my file, and we're closing it once the loop is done. And you'll see. You'll see. So this is good. As we know, all of that code will execute in order at once. If they are in separate notebook cells, we can technically execute them in any order. Now, this cell will open, read, and close the file. This cell will open, read, and close the file. If you remember the close command. So we're not using the context manager here. We're just using the open and close, the old, un, the old orthodox way. Pause for a moment and look at it. Now, let's move to exercise number five. Now that we have everything together and it is not going to behave strangely when printing files, we can begin to change our simple print expressions to something more complex. We can search for strings within other strings by executing the following Boolean expression. Example, in my example, I want to check if the lines with checking contains the word Theodosia. No, Theodosia is not equal to Theodosia. Yes, the capital letters are a real big thing in Python. Be aware of it. The lower cases and the upper cases, they have to match. They have to be exactly the same. So, we can use if Theodosia in line print found. If I execute this cell again, the previous one, it should open the file, iterate through it and print found her for the line in which this comes up, found. Depending on what is your text document, search for some string which is present. So basically, it's a filter that filters whatever the word I want you to do. Well, you can be a little bit creative at this point. I'll pause for a minute. And you can provide an input command and you can search throughout the text of different words. Instead of just a fixed word, Tedosia, you can search something else. So you can put an input command and make the user provide the string to search within the data. Number six, let's go to Excel number six. This isn't very useful either. I want to know the line number where this, list, this lyrics comes up. We can use enumerate. We definitely can. Covered in the previous workshops to provide line numbers alongside the elements themselves. Modify your for loop to use enumerate, which is passed to a file object. Replace your print statements to now print the line numbers, which is string appears. Found at zero. I want to print like that. So use the enumerate command. In my example, Tedosia only appears once on line zero, the first line. If I wanted to find a more common word, I'm going to search for V. Note, I can call the function lower on a string to convert all it all to a lowercase. This might make checking easier. I can check for V and V with a single check now. Example, if V in line lower, print found and the line number. I found some more entries which I missed before. All right. Here's a footnote for you to read. Have fun. Exercise number seven. Instead of just printing the lines where we have found V, lowercase and uppercase variants, let's append these lines to a fresh list. What I want you to do is number one, create an empty list, giving it a suitable variable name. Make sure this is done before your for loop, otherwise, you'll constantly make empty. Number two, if your chosen word is in the line, append the line to this list. After the file close line, print the lines both ways, see below. We can see that in indeed a list of strings. That's what I want you to do. I want you to find the line, tell me it's found, whatever the word I'm searching, at what line number, and I want you to append it to a list and make a print out of it. Easy choosy, isn't it? <laughs> 
or a nicer way we can iterate through this list we made and print each individual item or you can provide the slash n for the next line command and you can give me this it's upon you if you want to like do the previous way or this way whatever you feel comfortable with let's go to exercise number eight Notice how we seem to be getting an extra space between prints. This is due to the slash n, which enters at an end, or rather all of the slash n. We can move the trailing new lines spaces by calling r strip on our string. This proves this. We can check the following. Nightmare, this is excessive. Print nightmare, you'll see something a print like this. Yes, this is a lot of blank space. If we print nightmare dot r strip, it will return a string which is a rid of those special characters and all the spaces. Yes, it won't have all the spaces. And it will strip everything from the right and give you this is exp this is excessive by these commands. There's also something called L strip, but it's for you to experiment with. Let's move to writing files. Exercise nine. In a new cell, we need to open a file to write. Let's uh, write to the same file we've been working with. This time, we will specify mode write. Yes, we know we need to close the file, so let's write that in at the bottom before we forget. Yep. As before, we should see it's a valid file and the type is correct. So we open a file and this time we're using a write command and whatever you want to do, do it and it will get written and then you just close the file. Opening, processing, and closing. That's all. Number 10. We can call example line underscore file the write, passing it to a string to write to the files. The behavior of this depends on the file mode. In our case, we are on write, which will erase any existing content with word we put. If the file doesn't exist, it will create it. Write some content to the file by modifying the do stuff section of our code. After this, print up the file and check what you intended to write. Open in Notepad or Notepad++. Let's go to exercise 11. Sometimes later, but from now on, yeah, exercise 11. So sometimes later we realize that we missed off some information. Let's append that to our file now. Open the file in append mode, create a list, and put some strings you want to write in it. They can be gibberish, they can be anything. Note, they can also be numbers converted to strings, but if we just try numbers, we'll get an error. So do the gibberish, some gibberish uh, equals to a list, though a dear, a female, they are far, a long, long way to run. And I trade through this list and for each element, write this to the file. Don't forget to close the file. Open your file once finished and check if the original content is present within with your additions added to the bottom in the sequence. So some it should look something similar to this. Whoops. They're all on the same line in the file. Remember to add the special slash n. So this tells the Python it's a new line to each string you want to add. We can either change each string's element a little or do some string concatenation in the right line itself. Example, instead of dot writes, we can do write slash plus slash n. Saves a lot of us type n. Have a look. Ah, uh, almost. We need to make sure we write a new line at the end of the exercise 9 bit or before the first line written for this exercise. Try fixing this so you get the following output. Swings and roundabouts on this one. Let's move to exercise number 12. Take a pause, 5 minutes, get your brain a little bit refreshed, and then continue. If you're stuck, if you so far you understood the question so far, then trust me, you're on the right track. And if you're having problems, then go back to the lectures or send me text or send me a message. I'll help you. I'll help you with it. And do, do, do remember that there's a solved workshop T task available for you to look. And you can download that from your resources just, call, just to help you. Okay? So, let's continue. Exercise 12. In the lecture, we introduce context manager that starts with a with. And uh, you have to use alongside with S. Let's use this for now. So we F open another file, do stuff becomes with open uh, and as F and whatever you want to do within it. So duplicate your solutions to the previous answers 
involving the file opening, replacing the clunky open and close mechanism with some context manager. Try doing that. So, let's move to exercise number 13. Try the following in a new cell with open brackets, num, no exist text, sf, and pass. You should get the following output file not found error. This week, we also introduced try and accept, if you remember, for helping with error handling, which follows the following format. Try, whatever you want to do, accept, and issue, do this, block. Put the context manager in, it, in its entirety within the try block. Add a nice print message into the accept block, which alerts you that something happened. And try this. Exercise 40. We can improve this. Currently, we have no idea what the error is. Modify the accept line to catch the general exception. Exception, Using the as keyword, give it a useful name. Then use this in your print statement. Exercise 15. As we have already encountered this error, we can add a more specific accept clause above the general one. Make this cache the final not found error exception and get it to print something different. Except file not found is found, print this, this, this. This try except structure will prevent the whole of Python from erroring out. Any code after this structure will continue to be executed as normal. If this code is unrelated, then it will execute just fine. Be cautious of putting code outside this try structure if it relates to what's inside. The behavior of errors being swallowed by these except clauses is known as error hidden. So now we will be talking about CSV. In the previous one, we were focusing more about the try and accepts, the with and open, the context managers, how to deal with files, how to write them, open them, open them. Now we are focusing on CSV, comma, separated values. So on the downloadable resources in your Udemy account, you will find a wind underscore data to CSV file downloaded. And remember to download this to the same directory as your Python notebook, just like the text files from earlier. Exercise 7. Import CSV and read the wind underscore data the CSV file using a context manager. The file will be in the read mode. Create a CSV reader passing it the file we just opened from each line of this reader to see what data we are dealing with. Exercise 18. Extract the first line as this contains the headers. Store this as a variable. Take note of the type of this file. Of this line compared to our lines from the raw file reading earlier in the workshop. What do we notice? Exercise 19. Which index would we need to take the extract the wind speed attribute? For each line, obtain the wind speed index. Remember, index the correct index. This will be a string, convert, cast it to a float, append it to a list of wind speeds. No. Be careful not to include the headers in this, just data values. We do not need the headers and numbers to do the analysis on. Okay, let's go to number 20. How many wind speed records entries do we have? How, my, how might we find this out from the list we have just created? What is the average wind speed recorded in this uh, data? Hint, you may find the sum function useful here. What is the minimum speed? That's for you to do. And what is the maximum speed? Hence, they will help you while you're doing the exercise. Let's go to exercise number 21. Using a new context manager, this time set for write mode, create a CSV writer and write out your wind speed list. You created an example 18. View this file in a notepad or notepad plus plus to verify. Okay, ducks. So till here we have talked about CSVs and about the files, context managers and everything. From now on, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to some introduction to NumPy. Now we can use NumPy. So NumPy is used for numerical computing and allows us to convert from list to NumPy arrays. Basically, list and NumPy arrays are the same, but NumPy arrays are more NumPy-ish. These type have useful functionality defined on them. Have a look at the following code below. NumPy arrays behave very similar to Python standard list. However, they have more defined functions available to them for computational purposes. Previously, you had to create an expression to get the summation and then length and calculate the mean. NumPy has a function to do it. You do not have to go through summing or everything and then divide it by the count. 
To get an average, NumPy can do it for you. Remember, functions are useful for utilities and routines we may often require. Therefore, NumPy bundled a lot of these as behaviors on their own data type NumPy and NDRA. For scientific computing, NumPy is written with several optimizations in mind. This makes it significantly faster for calculating on large sets of data. So let's have a look. So before you start, you start with importing NumPy as NP. So x equals to NumPy np.array speed. You define the list, that's an array of NumPy. You print type speed and you print type x. So you print type print x bracket zero speed and starts indexing for so far equivalent is how we use them. And you check this one reverse indexing. And these are the useful statistics that you can use. Print mean x dot mean print max x dot max. This is a way max is the function and x is the array numpy array. So it works like x dot max. Then you print minimum x dot min. More complex statistical measures of spread dispersions. Print x dot standard deviation x dot variance. And you can try all of this. Go for it. Go crazy. So let's move to JSON, read and write. So recall Davy McDuck from this week's lectures. I have decided to add a new ad data attribute for ducks. The number of people they follow on Twitter. This is known as following. So duck one, first duck, Davy McDuck, and the followers and the following. So here's a dictionary for you to look at duck underscore one. Let's build up our duck collection. We can represent this as a list of dictionaries where each dictionary follows the same pattern for outlining a duck. First, let's define some ducks. Feel free to add your own. So here's my duck too. His name is Jim. Last name is Bob. Location is Turing Lab. Insane, false. Followers, one, two, three, 123. Following, 5,000. And weapons, squeak. And remorse, none. Here's my duck three. First name is Celeste. Last name, don't have. Location is Thorn Room. Insane, true. Followers, 40,189. Following one, her own account. And weapons, politics, dance move, chess grandmaster, and immortality. We shall put these in a list called duck collection. Duck collection equals to list duck one, duck two, and duck three. Go through the duck collection, make sure each element is in place and all your ducks are accounted for. Exercise 24, import JSON using a context manager, I mean with an as, open the JSON file for writing. Using json.dump, write your ducks collection to the file you have opened. Remember that the arguments are almost backwards from what we have used to. Open the file and we can copy its content, which are rather unbearable at the moment. And use a pretty printing website to make it a bit easy on you guys. Paste your file contents to this and see the output. Are all your ducks there? Do they have all their attributes? Pause the video for now. Go to this link and check. Okay, let's move to exercise 25. Using json.load, load your saved json file back in, assigning the output to a new list variable other than the collection. This should be identical to your duck collection. We can check for this by checking the equivalence between both lists. Exercise 26. Write some code which for each duck will calculate the difference between the number of people following them and the number of followers of the Twitter account. Positive if more people follow them than they follow. Print these, append them to an empty list called trendy ducks. Example for Davy, this would be his followers. Minus his following, in this case, one, uh, 12,865 minus 120, which equals to 12,745. Note, this should be done programmatically, not by yourself in the manual way. I might give you many more ducks. I want these resultant numbers for all ducks. Hint, how do we index dictionaries? Some dictionary key should give us the value. Our list we got, just got from json.load, has a dictionary at every index of our list, nested structures. So you would get an output something like this. So let's move to exercise 27. So what I want you to do here is I want you to NumPy has some 
I want you to go back to NumPy. So NumPy has some useful functionalities. If I wanted to find the trendiest duck, the one with the most net followers, follower minus following, I could use max or minimum. But this gives me the value back out, not necessarily which duck this relates to. I want an index so I can track the duck down. Convert the trendy drug list to a NumPy array. Error underscore 20 underscore ducks, NumPy array 20 ducks. We can now call argmax on this NumPy and array object or argmin to show which duck has the most or the least. Try doing it. If I assign a variable to that function call, I now have the index of the trendiest duck. I can use this to go back to my original duck collection list, which houses each duck dictionary and pull things like their name. Print the first name of the trendiest duck programmatically and print out the net following count, the thing you calculated. No manual entry here. This could, this course should work directly off of the list collection so that I can add more ducks and your code would work exactly the same. It has to be Pythonic. It has to be programmatic. It doesn't have to be manual. And maybe a new duck is crown champion. Hint. Duck collection would get our first duck. We can replace zero with any variable so long as it returns an integer. The collection would return a whole dictionary related to the duck. We can then reference the keys within the dictionary. Hint two, you may need to cast the net followers. NumPy likes to use its own primitive data types of numbers. You will see a print. There you go, I want to print like that. So let's go to exercise 28. Your boss has given you the task of creating a separate JSON file. In this file, he only wants ducks who have a net follower count greater than zero. You must filter out the ducks who follow more accounts than, than who follow them. And save these ducks back out to a JSON file, just like your input was. So these are the four things I want you to do in this exercise. Number one, reusing your net follower calculation, find indices of all the ducks you need. Number two, store them in a separate data structure. Create this and add the correct ducks to the indices. Number three, open a new file in write mode to put this JSON data into. Use a context manager with an as. Use json.dump to convert your separate data structure into JSON and store it in a file. This exercise will involve a lot of juggling of variables, data structure, and logic. Values and indices will need to be managed appropriately. Try doing this before moving into exercise 29, where we will look at nice feature of NumPy, which might be more helpful. So, 29. NumPy provides some functionality outside of these objects. Have a look at this. NPy where and the expression. This returns an ND array of indices where the expression holds true. For example, we can provide a whole array of values and expression which can be used to filter. NumPy will then not only find where the condition is true or false, but then convert those into indices and provide them. Example, we can find all the indices of ducks where the net follower count is even. Normally, we would pass an integer number to this expression. However, with NumPy arrays, it can be applied to every value. If we print the output of this expression, we should get a list of true-false where the condition holds. We can pass this true-false list into an NumPy where and it will convert those into indices for us. Have a look and try it out. This has written a tuple. If you remember tuple, a tuple is defined as brackets, item, item, and item. This trick here is that it's a single element. You can see by trailing comma, you get the actual array list which contains the indices you need to call zero on the NPy array result. Note if you want to convert a NumPy array back into a list, we can cast it just like we did with numbers weeks ago. As we can see, only one of our ducks has an even count. This is a duck at index 2. Surprise, it's Celeste again. So this is the last one exercise for you to go with. Copy your answer to exercise 28. And now use the NPware from example 29 to make your solution tidier, cleaner, and more readable. In my example, I did a Boolean expression for even numbers. You need to find those greater than 0. Hint, the array you get back contains elements which are the index to look up. Look up. A list comprehension is a perfect choice. It sounds complicated, but it's just a list of indices you want to go through and use them to reference the right decks, making a new list out of them. So, the extended exercises are optional, and this is something I won't be covering. 
but this is for you to look at it but there are no extended exercises this week because i know this workshop three tasks is a bit tougher than the last two workshop but this will train you to become a data scientist at this point i would ask you to go through the exercises again and try coding them yourself and if you get stuck and if you have a problem there is a solved workshop three task available for you to download and look through the codes so have fun see you at the workshop for three tasks solved in the next lecture bye hello welcome to the workshop three tasks solved and in the previous lecture we talked about just the questions that we're going to be focusing on for the workshop three task unsolved and now let's talk on the solution if you got stuck in the previous workshop then it's totally fine it was meant to be a little bit difficult so you can tone up your skills for data science and ai so in this one we will be going for the solution and you can just just cross check now and if at any point you're stuck and you can download this python notebook in your system whether it be mac linux or OS, whatever and check uh, if your codes are correct or if you have improvised like i really love improvisation and if you have some found something better way to do it that's good so i'll begin with the exercise one now and the exercise one it was all just meant to make a uh, example one dot data dot text and you were supposed to just write whatever you feel like like or you could just download the file that i've provided in the resource manager in exercise number two what i want you to do is i want you to print that file i want you to know what kind of file is there is an input and output file and the mode was readable that's it that's all i wanted you to do i hope you have done this now in exercise number three what i want you to do is i want you to print whatever is in the file and i want you to print it line by line and if you have done till here then you're pretty much good you made a for loop line in my file which you declared in the previous one right here and you just ran it line by line there you go and it gives you the print whatever the file holds now in the exercise number four all i want you to do is merge the file and instead of the context manager do it without a context manager with it with, with a, a close command and an open and all of the body within and exactly the same one i just want you to do the merging of the previous two exercises and if you're done through here you're good in the exercise number one what i want you to do is i want you to find a word if that existed in your file so how we started is we made a my underscore file open example one underscore data dot text with a mode of read and we print the file or the print the type of the file but the real thing is for line in my file if so there's a condition within a for loop that if the word whatever the word you choose whatever the word you want to find let's say there's dare and if you go upwards on the first line there is dare with a capital d so what this code will do is if it finds a word string there in line print found and then close so this is what it did it found it but is it enough no I, and then if you were next exercise what i want is i also want to found, find the index like the index the line number where they are so in exercise number six what i want you to guys do is modify your for loop to use enumerate which is passed on your file object replace your print statement to now uh print the line number which your string appears so what i want is i want you to find the word whatever the word it be and the line number within so let's move forward this is my code so my underscore file open the file it's exactly the same till here i'm just like adding stuff and this is my variable word underscore search and it's an input string and it asks you the word you want to search and once you're done you do the enumeration to find index for i comma line and enumerate my underscore file which is the file example of data dot text and if word search in line lower what lower does is it lowers or um, whatever the string you add here let's say you mistakenly 
at a capital J or so, it lowers it and checks found at line of i, whatever the i is at that instance, and the line, whatever the line is in the my underscore file, and then it so let me run it. Let's say my word is here. Yeah, there is no dear because I'm using a lowercase. What if I say and so you can find and at 7, 9, 12, 24, 30, 32, and <coughs> 35. Fair enough. So let's move forward to exercise number seven. In exercise number seven, what I want you to do is instead of finding just the numbers, I want you to find the line, but in a better way. So what I want you to do is create an empty list, giving it a suitable variable name. Make sure it is done before your for loop, otherwise you'll constantly make empty ones. If you choose, if you have chosen word is in the line, append the line to the list. After the line close line, print the list both ways. So it's gonna append. So I've made an empty list right here. And this is exactly the same, but right now I just wanted to enter the word to search. And for i, it's a for loop within an if loop, and it prints once the line is found, and it appends in my empty list, and then you can just print the empty list and close the file. There you go. So what I'm going to find is I'm just going to find a really basic word with d, and it will find all the lines where the d exists. Append in it in a list. There you go. Let's move forward. So in exercise eight, what I want you to do is just uh, just play with R strip and L strip. So you can do the R strip. So nightmare equals to this is excessive slash and slash and slash and print nightmare R strip plus coding. So this is excessive coding. It's pluses. It adds the string by stripping the excess and gives you a print and you can also do hello professori slash plus nightmare dot l strip so what it does is it does hello professori this is excessive so in the writing files exercise number nine what i want you to do is i want you to open the file in the right mode and print that's it and print the type so uh, the text io wrapper and the class should be text io wrapper Let's move to exercise number 10. In exercise number 10, what I want you to do is I want you to open the file and read in write format, write whatever you want to write in the file, then close it and read it again. So this should be easy. There you go. In exercise number 11, what I want you to do is I want you to uh, open a file here you go in append format and just append it in the end so what we're going to do is we open the file which is a text file in the mode append and some gibberish can be anything let's say this is a list with uh, which has uh, four elements and i want to append them in my previous list in my ex9 file since i've opened in the append format so i can say for a in range land some gibberish I want to write the lines and the sub gibberish whatever it is at a since a is going to be taking the index value or the value of some gibberish so whatever the a is index value is let's say in the start in the first item is going to be zero so some underscore gibberish at zero is do and in the next iteration when it becomes one it's a deer, the next a female deer for a long, long run way to run. And then you can read your file. And once you close it, and you can see that it has appended all of that in your file. There you go. And every time you run it, it gets appended again. This is the first time. Now this is the second time. And this is the th third time. And it, it will keep on appending and appending. Because that's how Python works, unless you flush the memory. 
which can be done from cell kernel clear output and then you can run all or the run whatever you want to run so let's go to exercise number 13 what I want you to do in exercise number 13, I want you to use a context manager with the try block and add a nice print message to the accept block which alerts you that something happened. So we're going to focus on, we, we wrote the command try with open a file that does not exist as f and then pass and accept print, uh uh, we're in trouble in case it doesn't run, Cat, catch it. So we tried and we didn't accept. And there you go, here's the print. So what, so what we're going to do in exercise number 14 is uh, we want to improve this. So currently we do not have an idea what the error is, but we want to use the exception, which is the general one, which takes all the errors in it. And I want you to make a print out of it. So we try opening a file, no exists, which doesn't exist, of course. and we pass the accept exception command, which is a general exception command, which takes all kinds of errors, and we print error found. And then we print type useful name. So there you go. It catches the error, whatever the error is, an exception. It's a type, and prints it. Now, in 15, what I want you to do is. I want you to use exactly this error that's occurring, which is in the previous one was file not found error. And you're using the file not found error in the not found and printing exactly without using the exception error. You're, you're targeting a concentrated, the real error, file not found error as not found and printing the print. Exactly the previous one, but better. In exercise number 16, what I want you to do is, I want you to download the resource when data to CSV in the same directory as a Python book, and just like the text files before earlier. Let's have a look at it. So in exercise number 17, I want you to create a CSV reader and passing the file that we just read, and I want you to print each line of this reader and see what we're doing. I want you to print all of the lines in the reader. I imported a CSV file, import CSV, this is the library. Again, if you don't have the CSV, go to CMD and just type pip install CSV and it will install the CSV library in your system. So we opened it with a context manager with, with open win data the CSV as win data and csv data csv underscore reader equals to csv dot reader win data delimiter comma and for line in csv reader print line that's it so it will what will do it it will print all of the lines so you might have this win data and it will print all of the lines of the data there you go let's move forward Exercise 18, what I want you to do is, I just want you to print the first line at index zero, which is the header line from the file. So I made an empty list and I opened it with as win data, CSV reader, this is from the previous one. And for line number line enumerate CSV reader, this variable right here, if line number equivalent to zero, which Always remember at zero the CSV in a CSV file is the header. I want you to catch the header. So if line number is equivalent to zero, then empty list one equals to line. Else continue. And when you print the empty list, there you go. You have it. You have all the CSV separated headers right here. Separated by commas. Let's move forward to exercise number 19. So what I want you to do in number 19 is, I want you to uh, find four things. Number one, which index would we need to take the extract the wind speed attribute? I want you to extract the wind speed. For each line obtain the wind speed, index the correct index. Number three, this will be a string, convert cast into a float. Append it to a list of wind speeds. So. What I want you to do is I want you to import the CSV file. What we do is we import the CSV file. I've already imported it, but just for the proof of concept. 
So win speed underscore data is an empty list. I opened it with win data dot csv is win data and csv reader equals to csv dot reader win data and the delimiter telling python how i'm going to use the csv and the delimiters so for line number comma line enumerate csv reader if the line number equals to zero i don't want it cut it because i don't want my data of the wind speed to have what do you say uh the headers and wind speed underscore data append float line two always remember this is the columns and if you go backwards uh wind speed is at index two zero one two so every time this for loop runs it will take the second zero one to the wind speed and append it into the wind speed data and you can just print it in the end and here's the list make sure this is out of the loop because i want the final result but if you put it in the loop then you will have a lot of data and buffering and you will have the answer but at the very end one but your but it, that's not the way we want the print right so there you go. See? Yeah. And even if you want to, you can do this. So the entries are 50,530. Let's go a little bit forward. So for active power, well, this is not included here, but this is an extra one. If you want to do it for an active power, let's say a different header. So the active power is at one. So you can do it for the index value of one. All I did was I changed it here at one, uh, where it was two. So it will gonna take the header values of active power, which is at zero, one. Let's move forward to exercise number 20. So in this one, what I want you to do is, I want you to do, do four things. I want you to know how many wind speed records entries do we have? How might we find this out from the list we've just created? You can use a len command to tell you the numbers. What is the average wind speed record in this data? Here's a hint, use the sum function. Number three, what is the minimum wind speed? And what is the maximum wind speed? So it's basically a little bit just calculation. So if in the first, if I'm asking you, then you can use a len command, which I used in the previous one to get the count of how many entries we have in the wind speed underscore data list. And the average speed, what I did was I did a sum of wind speeds and then divided by the wind speed entries, which is the count of the wind speed data. And to the max speed, I can do max and the list. And then for the min, I can use the min command and wind speed underscore data. And the rest is just print commands to show. So this is an extra thing I'm gonna show you. It's a little bit uh, labeling and plotting. And we're gonna focus and we're gonna find that in matplotlib in, in, the, next, in the next lecture, but just for to make you see how real, real data science works, how the plotting works. Here's a little bit graph for you to see a wind speed versus active power. This is just some extra information for you. So the maximum speed that came out was 25.2 uh, meter per second uh, or a mile. Yeah. And the minimum wind speed is zero. So at this time, I guess there was no wind speed. So let's go to exercise number 21. Do the, do the previous one exercise just with a context manager. So using a new context manager, this time set for the write mode, create a CSV writer and write your wind speed list you created in example 18. That's it, that's all I want you to do is I want you to open it and write the data in the CSV file or the wind speed data, that's all. So now we're gonna have a little bit talk about NumPy. So if you remember in the previous lecture, NumPy, treats list as errors and you have to define it as an error in order to process it we're going to, ex we're going to do exactly the previous exercise where we do the manual calculation by ourselves but this time we're going, to, we're going to use numpy so all i'm asking you to do is copy this code and run it but that's not everything i want you to understand the code as well so 
once you run it you will have this and you can have a look at it the first you import numpy is np speed at wind speed underscore data x equals to np dot array dot speed because now we're converting the speed list a python list into a numpy array so once you print the speed and type of x you see this is converted from a list to a numpy so we print speed standard indexing we're just checking if this x which is a numpy array at zero equals to speed at zero if it is equivalent to both of them it's true so this is just a proof of concept that when you convert into a numpy the index is exactly the same as the previous pythonic one so these are some useful statistics print mean mean equals to x dot mean max x dot max min x dot minimum in the previous one exercise in the 20 we had to do the calculation by ourselves for python which is not that quite difficult but if you use numpy it saves time they have pre-built functions so you save a lot of time and it can also give you a standard deri deviation and a variance and we don't have to do the standard deviation or the variance by ourselves mathematically you can just use the functions dot var and there you go so in exercise 23 we're going to have a look at the ducks so if you can recall davy mac duck what i want you to do is i want you to create just copy these all of these three ducks and insert it into a list called duck underscore collection which we will be using in the later exercises so as you can see this is a duck one duck two duck three and they are in the duck collection of duck one duck two and duck three i also made a print print duck collection to make you see through all of them and the total number of ducks are three there you go in exercise number 24 what i want you to do is i want you to import json using the context manager open the json file for writing so the mode is going to be w using json.dub write your dub collection to the file you've opened so we start with importing json and we say with open file for writing json w, which is the writing as f writing json.dump equal duck collection f writing so this is what i want to write and this is where I want to write it in, which is my f underscore writing, which I have wrote, which is as file underscore for underscore writing or JSON. In the next one with open, I'm opening it as a read, so I can read if it exists in, in my JSON file. And yes, it is existing in my JSON file. So Let's move to exercise number 25. Using json.load, load your save file back and assigning the output to a new list variable. Other than the collection, this should be identical to your duck collection. We can check this. Yeah. So we imported JSON with open. We opened it as a read mode as a, and we appointed, we loaded it into a new variable, which is new underscore var. And if new underscore var equals to duck collection, then print both are equal else no one's equal this is just to check if these are identical so when we run it oops yeah we haven't there is no file right now and i haven't saved it but yeah you did get the point so exercise number 26 in this exercise number 26 what i want you to do is i want you to print these all the ducks and find and append them in a list called 20 ducks and there you go so we did the 20 ducks it is a list we open the file and assign it to a new var json.load and just give me a minute please there you go and in this list what i want you to do is i want you to write all of whatever we have written in the file for writing in json in the new underscore var and then make a for loop and I, what, what i want you to do is i want you to find the net the net follower which can be the followers minus the following and then print and append in the 20 ducks so i want you to read this question again and well i have given you an explanation about it and give me a print exactly like this so what we have done is we have found the net followers and made a list of trendy ducks and here they are.
appended it into a new list. So let's move to exercise number 27. And in exercise number 27, which is quite easy, what I want you to do is I just want you to import, I want you to convert this into a NumPy. And I want you to print and find the maximum, like from the list before 20 ducks, who has the most followers. I want you to find them and I want you to name them whoever they are with the most followers. So the duck collection org argument 20, first name, have a look at it. In exercise number 28, what I want you to do is I want you to find the positive net followers of the duck Davy at index zero and at index two. There are four things I want you to do is I want you to using your net follower calculation and indices of all the ducks you need store them in a separate data structure, create this, open a new file in the right mode, put the JSON data, and use JSON dump to convert your say, uh, separate data structures into JSON and store it in the file. So there you go. Have a look at my code with open file for writing JSON in R, read format in F underscore writing. I define a variable new underscore var as JSON.load for F writing, and then a for loop in the range length and let's say if beta is greater than zero after finding the net followers, positive net followers for whatever the duck is at the string, at the index and paste. Yeah. So it will give you a print something like this of whoever have positive, positive followers, like not, nothing negative. And if you have a look at our previous trending ducks, there is one who has a negative one, so they will not fulfill the if command and will not be included here. And after it is done, I want you to append it in a store underscore file. And you can print it and check. So two ducks that have net followers in positive are Davy McDuck and Celeste. And there you go. So in number 29 exercise, all I want you to do is run these commands and check if there are NumPy errors Arrays and lists. So that that's it. And in the number 31, I want you to use a list comprehensions to exactly do the previous one that we have did here in a longer run, but with list comprehensions. So have a look at it. And if you get stuck somewhere, please send me a text from your Udemy account and I'll help you with it. So have fun. See ya. Bye. And meet you in workshop for now.